Hello all, welcome to another episode of MFP Live. I'm Donna Ladd, the founding editor of the Mississippi Free Press, and my co-host is Kimberly Griffin, who is the founding publisher of the Mississippi Free Press. Hey, Kimberly, how are you? Yay. And our, we're really excited about our, our uh, special guest today, who's Dr. Anna Wan. And I'm impressed right here when, when I say that she's an assistant professor of mathematics at the University of Southern Mississippi. Hello, Dr. Wan, how are you? We're tickled to have you here. Um, so, oh, look, we have an intro in the whole thing. Like, right, had met you. Um, he does work for the Innovate magazine and that kind of thing. And it's he's been telling me for a while how great you are. Um, and his interest is very, runs very deep in um, economic development issues and innovation um, and so on. Uh, so just what I'd love for you to do is just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and what your path was like to end up in this, uh, in this job it, in Hattiesburg, in Mississippi. Where are you from? Just fill us in. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so I was, I honestly thought I had it all figured out in high school. Um, I was gonna be an architect. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so obviously, you know, um, as in college, you change your major a couple of times. Yeah. You fail a couple of classes, mine yeah. happens to be math classes a couple of times. <laughs> you fail some math classes? Is that what oh, you yes. said? Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh wow! Absolutely. I love that. The whole Asians are good at mathing, not not at <laughs> stereotype. Not a, but you stereotype. are a professor of it now. So. Yes, yes. So there's a lot more math after calculus, and so okay. um, yeah. calculus, at, like most of us, is a stumbling block in the STEM fields. Um, but math really, really, definitely opens up after that. So um, I was a high school teacher for a while, and then I went where? to Auburn. Where? I was a high school teacher in California. Okay. So in Southern California, um, Northern Los Angeles area. It, it was it was a really really neat school in the sense that it there were thirty six hundred students wow. at that high school. It's wow. a comprehensive high school. Wow wow wow. So <laughs> class sizes of 30, 40, you know. Um, so so it was really really neat. I really enjoyed it. Um, and then at some point, I decided I need to go to grad school um, just to learn more about teaching and learning. And in mm -hmm. 2009, California declared bankruptcy, I do believe. So my um, position in California was no longer, um, my position as a high school teacher was no longer um, mm -hmm. kept for me. So mm -hmm. at that point, after my PhD, I decided, well, I guess college is the route. And I really love to work with students and to just bring math alive and make it interesting. So that's kind of been my passion and that's part of what caused me to make this makerspace. Um, mm -hmm. And so part of being in a makerspace right now, what funds it is being innovative and, and working with um, community, with business, with entrepreneurship, but deep at the heart of it, all students take math and um, we can innovate through um, mathematics and digital fabrication. And I, I feel I, I truly be believe that that's where we start. And then obviously you could create and design things and market them and patent them and all that. So hopefully okay. that. Uh, <laughs> Tell us exactly what a makerspace is for those who don't know. And then, yeah. and then yeah. tell us what about the makerspace at the University of Southern Mississippi. Okay, so makerspace generally is just somewhere where um, we connect the equipment to people that know how to use the equipment and people that want to use the equipment. So obviously, like it's intimidating to buy a 3D printer online and use it at home. So what a makerspace does is we have the 3D printers here. We have people that know how to use them. And then um, for those that want to learn, then you come in and learn how to use it to create what you want to create. And maybe eventually you buy a 3D printer at home yourself. Hmm. So, um, so that actually is some of our pre-service teachers. So they're, they're, we train future teachers here to work with 
classroom students in our makerspace. Um, so in a laboratory setting before they go out to teach. Um, and so it, it helps us minimize the technological difficulties in teaching with digital fabrication. So that's what makes our makerspace unique. Now, underneath makerspaces, there are these things called fab labs. Jackson County has a fab lab. Um, hmm. I want to say there's there are other fab labs in the state of Mississippi, I do believe, but they have a specific set of equipment. Um, but and and it's done through fab. It's fab foundation at MIT. So every single fab lab has the same type of equipment. So if you deviate th from that, you're not necessarily a fab lab. So basically we're a makerspace. <laughs> so make that come mm -hmm. alive for people. What mm -hmm. talk about some things you make, you know, like. Uh, so recently with um, COVID-19, we've made COVID responsive PPE or uh, personalized mm -hmm. protective equipment. Um, so one of our big hits was the hub mask. And so um, this fits around your face quite well. And especially if it's clear, it's easier. It's harder to see if it's clear. So I use this one for demo purposes. Um, but basically we put the N95 filter on that. Um, and then um, basically if you put a heat gun on it, it conforms to your face. Hmm. a lot more and it's comfortable because it's an even pressure mm -hmm. along all these parts on your face mm -hmm. um and it circle it, it the physics of it allows for you to get a good breath in a good breath out hmm. um so that's one of nine things that we've made in-house um during covid times not covid times where <laughs> students are making coin mazes or mm -hmm. Or <laughs> different <laughs> different little toys or games or game pieces um, or engineering robotics things. That's one of our um, build a three D printer camp for teachers. So teachers spend I want wow. to say it was like four hundred dollars. They build their three D printer here. They spend a day on making activities, and then they just bring that three D printer back to their classroom. Hmm. So so tell us let's talk because you came to us <laughs> because of the work you've done with the COVID responsive um, mm -hmm. masks, PPE, I guess PPE. When mm -hmm. we were talking earlier, you were saying, you know, COVID responses, responsive is different from Ebola responsive. Explain how that works and how this wonderful little lab in Hattiesburg, Mississippi can do that. So, uh, so, uh, so with Ebola, I was talking about, they have a body um, transport device. And so you could kind of see behind me here, there's some stretchers from ambulances. And so usually for like Ebola patient transport, you build a cage around, a, you, you slide a patient into this giant cage that fits on top of a stretcher. Um, and what we found that is that with COVID, it was enough of a decrease of the COVID virus um, transfer to just put blankets over the person that you could sanitize later, and then just a headgear, like a, a bag around the patient's head for uh, safer transport through our ambulances because they're in a closed confined space back there and the patient's still coughing. So that is a COVID responsive PPE versus a general thing from World Health Organization or WHO, who has said, you know, pa safe patient transport is this giant cage that goes on top of the stretcher. Interesting, interesting. Wow. Who, who can, <laughs> I know, it's mind blowing. Who can <laughs> come to the lab? How do you come to the makerspace? What do we do to get involved? So we are the first um, Mississippi University to uh, have it open to the public. So just email me. Or, and then generally I'll forward it to my shop technician and he'll um, he'll work with you to develop ideas. I think we, we've we been signing a whole bunch of NDAs in the past couple of years. Um, and my email is, yeah, Anna one at usm.edu. Um, and so we've, but like some of the ones that we haven't signed for are unique chess pieces or bath bomb molds. Uh, to, to create some of that stuff for people for whatever they're using 
um, or or maybe to start up business. So in the business model, I think we're called what what's called a pre pre incubation uh, makerspace. So basically, you have an idea of what you want to make, you're not too sure of the equipment you want to use. And we have a plethora of, of 3D printers, laser cutters and CNC mills, all of this digital fabrication. So making with a computer, um, we have all of this equipment to help you make what it is you want to make. Um, so I, so we're, we're in the student union, the hub complex here on campus, which is right. a, a public facing building on campus. So we can host public to come in and, and work with the public on things like that. And part of that was so that I could have K-12 students come on field trips. And this was just a happy <laughs> uh, <laughs> side effect of that. So definitely right, right. Um, what you see there is one of our um, PCB mills and PCB oven. That's that bubbly looking thing. So we could make our, um, basically we could make circuit boards um, in-house and, wow. and, and heat them up so that it works. Um, back there is a Mark Forged X7 it, in that gray thing. That is um, a carbon fiber 3D printer. Between the bubbly thing and the taller gray thing is okay. our um, laser cutter. So um, we can etch marble. We could cut. Uh, actually, one of the main things that we cut with that is um, some of the plexiglass stuff for our um, uh, another COVID responsive thing is an intubation chamber or Rona glass, as Dr. Mary Assad puts it at um, Forest General. She What she, does that do? <laughs> so it shields the doctor that's intubating you from COVID spray. And uh, <laughs> wow, yeah, because you're up close and personal when you're intubating a person. Um, and so they're, they're coughing, they're spasming, whatever. And so it's like a chamber with armholes and you go in and intubate them that way. Wow. Wow. I know, I'm like, wow. Okay. So, um, I know we're so impressed. <laughs> I love it. Kimberly's going to be like, you know, oh down. down 49. I know. Yeah. Um, well, the whole team is showing up. Um, but you know, one of the things I'll often talk about the fact that I, um, in the past have started a Mississippi youth media project uh, with teenagers mm -hmm. during summers. And it's mm -hmm. something that we hope to bring back after the pandemic. Um, right. But, uh, you know, I know, you know, from that experience, just, you know, how much uh, young people getting their hands on equipment that does interesting things right matters and how much it uh engages and you know all these almost cliches but they're so important right yeah. like even being able to use the keyboard and, and you know to make their own music and figure those things out for their videos the level that you're talking about the kinds of things that they're getting to do mm -hmm. kind of within the stem world i guess mm -hmm. is just super exciting and so i guess it's not really a question. I'd just like you to talk more about what it's like uh, to have younger people, whether they're college students or younger people, you're talking mm -hmm. about you bring K-12 in, ours were high school. What is that like? Just talk about that. I get goosebumps. Uh, so, I mean, I was, so this is part of the stereotype, right? My mom always told me, well, Asians are supposed to be good at math. So work harder because you suck at it. <laughs> but, <laughs> and here you math. are, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> here I am, right? Uh, yeah, my, my high school, oh, sorry. So my high school algebra you know, teacher could probably contest to yeah. the suckiness of uh, me back in the day. <laughs> But uh, but the thing is, I, I to see these light bulbs go off right mm -hmm. at any age, um, I think it's kind of neat, and and mm -hmm. it's it's giving these students the opportunity. So we in in education literature we've talked about um, it's not an achievement gap; it's an opportunity gap. That's right. Yeah. And so, yeah. like for them to come into a space where um, I'm going to just turn this around. Oop, where'd it go? Turn this around a bit. So you see how we have a whole bunch of um, 
monitors and keyboards and things back there. Right. Um, so we actually, uh, I am a Raspberry Pi educator. So we take Raspberry Pis, it's like a $50 computer and it's just a little thing, but we hook it up to the monitors and the keyboards and all of a sudden they have a mini computer that they can program to do whatever they want to do with it. And we have wow. 30 network jacks in here. So this is actually our IoT lab or internet of things lab. And so they could hardwire in and do a whole bunch of programming that wasn't accessible for K-12 students back in the day, even college students. Yes, that's the Raspberry Pi. So, I mean, it's, oh, it's $30 now. So it gets cheaper and cheaper <laughs> as we do this. Wow. I think mm -hmm. I've seen those lying around Todd's office. So <laughs> I know what you, I think. <laughs> Something that yeah. looks like that. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, so it's just to watch those light bulbs go off and engage in these students in ways that they haven't been engaged with before and to make math and programming come alive in ways that just, you know, we've come a long way since Logo in math with this little turtle that you program to go in a maze. Like, right. it, it, it's, been, it's been ages since that. And I'd like for our, um, I, I'd like for our classroom teachers to be able to reflect that and bring that to the students. So um, again, just goosebumps to watch lights go off and, kids get engaged in different ways other than say just sports or I'm not, I'm not downplaying sports. No, I understand. That, that's important, but there are alternate routes to college. So right. um, robotics, right. coding, all of that. Definitely. So that's JRTC. Um, so we hosted um, JRTC here. And I think that was one where we used Kali Linux and caused uh, USM's uh, high tech department to have a heart attack that day because basically those computers <laughs> were hacking to, into each other. Oh, wow. And we had to make sure to guarantee that they were off of the USM network <laughs> when they're That's doing like that. a bad movie of some sort, you know, <laughs> somehow. But it's cyber warfare, right? <laughs> right, so it's yeah, giving, yeah. Giving this, these high school students a taste of what cyber warfare is like. Wow. And I think that class was taught by one of ours, uh, one of ours, uh, he's in Army ROTC, he's now a commissioned officer, uh, Zachary Pulver. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so just kind of folding that back on itself, having students graduate from our program that teach other students that have been going through the program. So it's, it's really, I, I just get goosebumps every time I see things happen in here. Wow, I can only, I mean, I was the same way in our project and we, weren't doing mm -hmm. you know that you know no 3d printers that's for sure and other things i mean that's really exciting wow right. we are missing a sound studio so oftentimes yeah. in maker spaces they have sound studios yeah. they have video yeah, yeah. equipment mm -hmm. and we just don't right. have that and i think that is part of fab lab i think yeah. i do believe they have some of that and so we just focus on digital fabrication right wow so one of the things I'm hearing you talk about is mm -hmm. um, the STEM, STEM careers. You are showing people ways to have a STEM career that's not the stereotype that we're sold, right? Right. So Absolutely. you can do, you can make bath bombs and yes. uh, <laughs> custom chess pieces and you can become a commissioned officer in the military. Tell us some of the ways you've seen people kind of sprout out and what they've done within their careers or in their college careers, or what they've learned in your. So when we pre-COVID days, um, we pre-COVID days, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Typically, we have about five to ten um, work study students that just you know they they have the work study allowance, and so I hire them to be in here. But I pick and choose them to be of different um, disciplines across campus. So I have wow. accounting majors, I have digital media majors, I have English majors, psychology majors. And so they've all done something. And I, I don't know if those were the kind of kids that were um, mm -hmm. inclined to do this anyways, because they applied and they went through a rigorous interview process to, to, to become work study students here. But one of them, I want to say Ashley Funkhauser, she's um, she's now at York, I do believe, and she does. She's a psych, she was a psychology major, and she does um, AR VR stuff. Mm -hmm. 
I wow. mean, it's just yeah. really, really cool stuff. <laughs> so because one of the things, yeah, one of the things we talked about, and I can't remember the guests, but we we talked about how um, we sort of, and Wendy Schinefeld, one of our board members, was talking about steam. Mm -hmm. We sort of tipped the balance too far in this country where it was STEM, STEM, STEM. And we turned a lot of our colleges into doctor, engineer, pharmacy factories. And what you ended up with, in my experience, is a generation of people who didn't have that liberal arts foundation and could not critically think themselves out of situations. So if this medicine doesn't work, or if this building is looking a little strange, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. It feels like that you are really creating helping us create a different generation of folks. Right, so it's neat to watch these students interact, right? So I'm also the faculty advisor for ACM, Association for Computing Machinery, and IEEE, those student chapters, IEEE is Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers. So both of those chapters are through School of Computing, and it just makes sense for me to advise them in Eagle Maker Hub because they have cubbies down there <laughs> that they take residence in again pre-COVID. So they work with my work study students. So they have the tech stuff, but sometimes they're not necessarily the best with our K-12 students. Mm -hmm. So the work study students work with them and, and devise activities or devise events and they work together collaboratively. Mm -hmm. um, another student that I can think of, Dallin Blanks right now, um, he's he, I think he was still one of my work study students up till COVID and he's an, a digital media major and he's made some of our coolest logos and some of our coolest flyers and he's able to convey things in, in an artistic way. Right. Like if, if it were left up to me, I would just have a hex document to show you what we do. Right. <laughs> he right. makes it appetizing and pleasing. So, so it's, it's been amazing. Wow. Well, you know, I've seen, um, you know, I've seen some of the articles recently where uh, mm -hmm. about concerns uh, within STEM uh, education, I believe, uh, uh, over, uh, you know, young people of color and women be, still be, being underrepresented in ways. Um, and I think there was some, I didn't look at this before the show, but I think there was a study recently that was talking about this. Um, so, I mean, what do you think about that? And then what do you, you know, what do you think some of the solutions would be to that, particularly like here in Mississippi? You know, how do we? So I stand do? with the shoulders of giants, if you will. I'm not going to say I stand on the shoulders right. of giants, but I, I will say within the state. Uh, so generally, I want to say it was like 10 years ago or some some bigger number years ago. Um, they asked girls and boys in K-12 uh, what a scientist looks like. And so they drew a male in a lab coat. And so we've seen a fluctuating change in that. Um, there's, there's a lot of women mm -hmm. um, that are like, hey, I'm a scientist. And, and so the drawings for what a scientist looks like has changed over the years, if we just use that as a litmus test. Um, now, some major, major giants in, in STEM education um, within the state, Dr. Julie Swicklow, who's here at USM, and Dr. Uh, Sarah Lee, who's now at USM. Mm -hmm. uh, she is the director for School of Computing and Engineering. There's a new name for them. But anyways, <laughs> Dr. Sarah Lee um, is bringing cybersecurity. She's doing quite a bit. She She's worked with FedEx and she she has industry experience and bring computer science to women and underrepresented groups. She's, I think she's done a lot with Coding Academy. Yes, her. Um, <laughs> she is a powerhouse. And then Dr. Julie Swickla, who is the director of the Center for Science and Math Education. So she's done a lot of hackathons um, that JRTC um, event that you saw with the students hacking with Kali Linux and here that was um, event by Dr. Julie Swickla. So we've done that for two or three years, I think, in mm -hmm. a row before um, COVID, obviously. So I think that has is changing. I, I'm not going to say has changed, 
Mm -hmm. Um, But I think we are making a move in the right direction. Definitely. Mm -hmm. What else does it needs to happen outside of what you, you guys are doing? I mean, you know, like if people in the, in, (laughs) in, in media or in, you know, um, in other just everyday people, if they're trying to think about interesting young people in STEM careers or get it, get them experience or whatever, what would be your advice? I think it's just community engagement, right? Mm-hmm. So one, one of the things I think I've been trying to get funded for a while now, definitely um, is, uh, sorry. So one of the things I've been trying to get funded is a makerspace van to go out to the local communities mm, with wow. the equipment. Um, Lamar County has mm-hmm. one for Lamar County schools. Really? And, they have a makerspace trailer. And so some of the school mm-hmm. districts have things like that. So Jackson County Fab Lab has a mobile trailer or actually, yeah, a mobile trailer that goes out. It has its own power source. So we've, we've been working on potentially securing funding for that. And, and again, this is all outside of me teaching mathematics. So of course. <laughs> like you're busy. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we are trying, but you know, um, so, so things like that, I think, will definitely help. I do events, but there's only so much that I can fit into my husband's handicap, mm-hmm. handicap converted man right. <laughs> as I carted right. out to the schools that, you know, right, um, right. I think having a mobile makerspace probably would help a little more. But I think we're doing, I, I mean, Julie, <laughs> Sarah, she, Sarah has the coding academies. So yeah. I think a lot of positivity is going on. And I think as we're uh, approaching a new uh, new way of interacting with others in a public space, I think um, there's going to be some more norms that, uh, that are going to occur. Um, and, and we could go forth from there. But that's go ahead and get out of... Uh, <laughs> COVID times. Right. Well, yes. that would help. Yes. That would help everyone, yes. right? Yeah. Right. So you and I were, when we talked earlier, I just was yeah. doing a quick check-in. We talked about this myriad of misconceptions that you have faced mm-hmm. coming from all different arenas, being a Chinese person born in America. <laughs> Can you... Can you just, I, I want you to give me, tell, tell them everything you told me earlier um, <laughs> about being in the Chinese restaurant, your police stop, um, <laughs> your three times you fail calculus and everybody being stunned. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there were multiple failures of calculus and pre-calculus there. Uh, Mr. Michael Bowen is one of the calculus oh, pre-calculus teachers that finally was like, look, just turn in your homework. <laughs> right. He was at uh, Oxnard College at the time. So definitely, um, so there is that stigma that Asians are good at math or Asians are good at um, academia. And that is definitely not, <laughs> I think everyone can be good and everyone can be bad if they choose to be, right? right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, it, it, so with that, I, I think it was a lot of, you know, student success is based on, I think there are studies and I can't cite them right now, but um, the predictor of student success is teacher, uh, their parents reading to them. And my parents definitely mm-hmm. cared, right. really, right. really deeply cared and had the time to care about my educational well-being. Um, I don't think that others may have that privilege. And I, I definitely know that that is one of the privileges that I had growing up. Um, so with that, I think, um, I think whatever, it, I, there's a lot of Joe Bowler stuff, J-O-B-A-L-E-R, Joe Bowler stuff that talks about um, how if you think you're bad at math, you're probably haven't been, at, you're, the mathematics capability hasn't been accessed yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. you're probably good at math in some way, somehow, or you've decided, um, and, and there's other myriad of studies that have said students like decide by the time they're in middle school that they're whether or not they're STEM. Um, and wow. I just didn't have the choice <laughs> to right. not be good at STEM. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so given that, I think um, so. That's why I really, really push K twelve. Um, 
you know, making that math accessible for students, definitely because of my background with that. Um, oh, and then I guess you mentioned yeah, the those stories. I want to hear those stories that you were the telling. Stories, okay. I wasn't here. Uh, oh yeah, the police stop. Yeah, the 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 policeman would. I mean, granted, I think the southernism is bless his heart. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not that's kind names. of an insult. Oh, yeah. well, oh, it, it, it can kind of go either way, but it's weird. Yeah. You just it, didn't know any better, I guess. But yeah. basically, I made a left at a right turn only. And uh, he said, he told me, well, this is America. Learn to read. Uh, <laughs> I, and, and at first, when he pulled me over, he asked me for my documentation. And I went, you mean my license and registration? <laughs> this isn't my first traffic stop, buddy. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, so yeah, there's, there's definitely things like that. And it doesn't only occur in the South or it doesn't only occur in Mississippi. It occurs everywhere. Um, the best parts are when they speak really loudly and really slowly. To me. Oh, right. Wow. <laughs> Cause then it's like, well, I guess I have nowhere to be. I will respond in kind because apparently that's your method of communication. So the <laughs> Yeah, they, they do that after they hear you talk. No, I mean, that's just, yes. you know, uh, yeah, that's, it's that's almost like it, Yeah, It's almost like it doesn't register, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, ast that's astounding. Yeah. Well, you know, you were talking about, you know, digging a little bit more, you, I, what, when you were talking about this expectation that you're going to be good at math or good at science, mm -hmm. smart, um, and I know that there's what's it called the model minority myth. I think, yeah, um, right. So talk more about that because I think it I think it would be helpful to help people understand why it's a problem to for you. It, you know, instead of being like for some other groups, quote unquote, of people to be assumed not to be smart enough or capable enough, which is all bigotry. But yeah, how, but what's the problem on this end? Because some people might say, "Well, you know, especially white people, that that's a good thing, right?" So, it's, talk more about that. I think it for me, it kind of actually falls into identity. Um, yeah. So there's there's um, there's a a bit of timidness that came with growing up. My mom would always, um, so both my parents are immigrants, obviously, but. But it's not so obvious in the sense that I have Asian American friends whose parents worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. Hmm. I'm not that great at history, but I think that was a long time ago. <laughs> right, 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 right. So they've been here for a couple of generations. Um, so in that sense, <laughs> my parents worried about me being out of line. Um, they worried a bit about me acting too out of turn or too loud or um because they they have this you know don't, don't act up in school don't um just you know if you need to go to detention and even if the teacher caught you talking and it wasn't you or whatever just go to detention and admit you were wrong and apologize mm -hmm. and so there was a lot of that learned behavior growing mm -hmm. up and it, it's not you know i think it's it's a signal of the times right so they were trying to fit in um, and they were trying to help me fit in. And so obviously, so my sister's name is Katie. My name is Anna. You know, it's not something that looks unpronounceable. <laughs> and that was a conscientious thought on my parents' mm. behalf, I think, also. Um, so, so there is quite a bit of that. Um, so, I, and I, and I see some of, my colleague students struggle. Um, I've worked all across the US. And so some of my colleagues being in the math department and STEM fields, um, you know, some of the other faculty, their their children are first generation. So they're struggling mm -hmm. with the racism and the, you know, how to act up in school and things like that. And I, you know, it, it everyone has their path. Everyone has their cross to bear, if you will. And I think it would I I kind of like how it turned out. So <laughs> it kind of it worked out for me. But yeah. I don't know that it it 
for for my friends that have struggled, it's just I I don't know. I just feel very lucky to have the parents um, that I have, mm-hmm. and I feel very lucky to have the community support that I have. Um, and others that are struggling through. I mean, definitely, if you see someone that you 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 respect as a role model, like Julie Swickla was a great role model to me when I first came to USM. And uh, you know, how do, how do I go through research? How do I how do I navigate some of these things that you know I am first generation in the U.S. Obviously, so it's not like we we've. we've in academia, there's like some students now or some faculty whose parents were faculty before. And mm-hmm. wow, so there, there, there's, there's um, legacies mm-hmm. of that. Whereas um, if, you're, if you're feeling that you're struggling, reach out. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm always open to anyone that wants to talk or needs some mentoring or whatever. And I'm always reaching out to mentors. So it, it, I think- right. Having that community is what's important, definitely. Well, well, and it feels a little like um, kind of digging a little deeper on that model mm-hmm. minority. Um, <laughs> there's oh, I lost the earbud. Sorry. There's a, a kind of a double edged sword there because mm-hmm. you know I grew up in a community with a different kind of model minority, and that community was you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, a PhD, maybe a nurse. Maybe you'll be worked at the post office, maybe. But there were these kind of six things that you were supposed to do. If you came to your parents saying that you were going to do something else, then that was problematic. Mm-hmm. Um, so it kind of led people on a a path that maybe wasn't theirs. Mm-hmm. And then those people that everyone thought, well, you're this person's kid, so you're supposed to be a doctor. It was we were blind to a people. Like I have a friend who I went to high school with and he's an attorney now. And I am a guarantee you none of his teachers encouraged him, expected him to be had any, you know, had any because they couldn't see him as in that way because he wasn't part of the model minority group. Yeah. Um, so my husband actually, so I he he's in a wheelchair. He has spinal muscular atrophy. So, you know, when you look at him. He's not one of the, he'll say, he's not one of those wheelchair guys that you look at him and go, oh, he was injured. He looks like he was born that way. <laughs> yeah. Right. He's, he's, he's contracted and whatnot. So um, I don't think there, he's a minority in the sense that he's got a very visible disability. And oftentimes it, they expect, well, you know, you could just collect that disability check. Right. <laughs> it costs more for him to go to work (laughs) than to collect that disability check. And he, and so the website you pulled up that is my personal website. He actually does all of that. He's a web developer for mad genius. Oh wow! So he he does a lot of, a lot of stuff in that sense. So, um, so when, when I think about that, there's the, I think people are going to expect what they're going to expect. Yes. That, that website, that's all him. I, I don't know what he does. He just <laughs> pulls it together and goes, do you like the way it looks? Yeah. And I go, Here. Here. Which is the way we think of what you do, by the way, but that's fine. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. So, yeah. So there's, the. it's almost like they expected him not to go to college, expected him, you know, mm-hmm. not, he, he actually has a master's in um, Spanish literature and then he made this swap. And wow. so he actually leads him and his brother, um, Blake Watson, they're leading my hackability.camp, um, which is a camp funded by NSA for high schoolers who are in wheelchairs. And it's a wow. residential camp. If you choose to come, it's four days through wow. um, for cybersecurity. So it's wow. a gen cyber grant through NSA. It's funded. It's free. You know, just come here. You're going to get our doing, yes, hackability.camp. Um, so basically, it's for high schoolers in wheelchairs that are learning about tech and don't, you know, I think back in his day, he was interested in journalism. So they said, well, why don't you get a degree in journalism? So his undergrad was actually in journalism. But then he was like chasing after these stories mm-hmm. and his physical limitations, right. you know, right. um, 
And then he kind of fell in love with coding. So basically we're opening, giving opening opportunities for students to visit some of these things that may not be covered in your K-12 curriculum uh, um, to hopefully spark some interest in that way. And it's for students who are in wheelchairs, partially because we have some activities like hack your wheelchair. So don't tell Permobile or Invacare that we're not taking apart the wheelchair. We're just adding like a couple of years, we're adding some robotic things. We're not even yeah. talking about the battery. Just, but, yeah. But yeah. you're going to get a call after this. After this uh... <laughs> Are you voiding that warranty on that point? <laughs> right. you, right. you could no, we're just some... making it cooler. <laughs> it's just better. We're adding an LED strip to the wheels. Come on. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Right? <laughs> oh, wow. So wow. one of the things you and I um, talked about earlier, well, we talked about it a little bit, is, mm -hmm. you know, we understand now you know, academia has been uh, predominantly male, predominantly mm -hmm. white. Um, and in the math and sciences, it's not a surprise for many because we have this idea, it's, maybe it should be a surprise to see Asian people, but across campus, it's, you know, it can, it has been, I know that's changing. Can you tell us about obstacles you've encountered of be being a woman in academia and what that often, you know, the twists and turns it takes you and what that often looks like and feels like. Oh, well, I do remember, and I won't state, state the name of the university, but I do remember being in a math class where um, a professor told me, you are a, so I'm, my, my PhD is in math education, um, but right. we pretty much take the same core coursework as a, um, we take the same core coursework as um, math PhD up to a certain point. So we have the equivalent of a math master's. Um, and I remember being in one of these classes and the professor said, well, no math education person has ever made above a B in this class. And I don't expect wow. you all. And guess what I made? A B. <laughs> like, I <know. laughs> and I could have stopped there and filed lawsuit or whatever, you know, yeah. just academic and fought it. But it was one of those things. I, I think there's a, I don't know if it's a Chinese proverb. I get these things um, mixed up. But if you stop to yell at every dog along the way that barks mm -hmm. at you, you're never going to get to where you're going to get to. Totally, and, totally believe that. Right. You know, in our, right. in my world, our world, yes. And it's right. just, it's yeah. one of those things you just have to keep going. Like you to pick your dog. <laughs> right. 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 Your dog. Right. At some point, you might have to pick a dog. But yeah, I was right. Right. Yeah. Or as Julie Swickler puts it, don't play in the mud. Yeah. <laughs> just don't play right. in the mud. Um. So definitely, there's a lot of things, but you know, finding those mentors is so important mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to help like, hey, you know, you, you find someone that you perceive to be ahead of you <laughs> and you find that they're human too. But hey, you know, I want to get here. And it looks like, yes, that- <laughs> Churchill. <laughs> <It's> Churchill. <laughs> I, I think we all bought, I think he probably borrowed it from yeah. someone else. <laughs> probably. <laughs> There's something, right, right. And so I think about, um, you know, I reach out to the mentors in the area. Like, right, I, I used to have issues getting math education pieces published. So, like, I'm in one of those, like, publish or perish kind of things where I need to publish to keep oh, my job. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I I seek out people that have published in 3D printing and mathematics and and talk with them about their routes to get there. So instead of me just spinning my wheels, you know, just reach out. People are a lot friendlier than you think they might be. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. so this this whole thing of mentorship definitely. Um, so, I I think that's, but yeah, it's been a struggle, and it's even in my own family. So, my um, dad's dad have has said back in the day, "Oh, uh, you're just a girl, so we just expect you to get married off." You know, it, going to college might be a good way to meet your husband. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it's just one of those things, you know, it, it is what it is. I don't think mm -hmm. he meant anything bad by it. 
Um, but just being a woman in, <laughs> in, in STEM is not the easiest, but as there are more and more women existing to help, help other women along, you know, definitely reach out. And, uh, that I think that is creating that community. Definitely. Um, right. Mm -hmm. And some of those women, I mean, I follow, <laughs> I follow a number of, uh, tech women, let's just say mm -hmm. on, on Twitter. I don't always understand about half of what they're talking about on the technical side, <laughs> but, but the reason I follow them in all seriousness mm -hmm. is because I'm not even going to think of any of their names at this moment, uh, long day here, but um, is because of the way they are challenging um, the, even, even within the AI and the, the, mm -hmm. the things that are going on with mm -hmm. algorithms and, you know, all of these things. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of understand enough to know that this is very, very important um, that who is doing, who's making those decisions, how they're happening, and then how they're the algorithms within our uh, tech companies and the kinds of decisions that they're making is affecting the larger, the larger communities, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're really inspiring, you know, to see mm -hmm. these women out here and, and really kind of, they are kicking some dogs in, in a sense, you know, <laughs> really, because yeah. they're challenging the status quo on some of these mm -hmm. things. And, you know, the big fight at Google and some of the other things that have happened. So that's really, that's really inspiring to watch yeah. that happen. I will say though, like, so on the, Asian front. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of, you call them import Asians or Asians that have, um, Asians that have moved, immigrated to the U.S. to fill some of these job roles that our own U.S. workforce isn't mm -hmm. filling for some odd reason or whatever it may be. So we have a lot of, we have a decent amount of um, Asian professors, we have a decent amount of Asians that work at Google and Apple. Um, so I think, so that might create a wrongful look at, oh, we're taking all, they're taking all these jobs. Well, you know, if there are qualified U.S. citizens, then, you know, that wouldn't necessarily. So I, I, I know that I'm touching on a much bigger picture much bigger issue here mm -hmm. um, for sure. But, you know, there, you can't blame them for being here when they were given the, <laughs> when they rightfully earned that, that job. So. That's right. That's right. So we were talking a little bit about, and we've had this conversation around um, COVID vaccine mm -hmm. and how talking about vaccine hesitancy, because, for generations, um, drugs, vaccines were not properly tested on people of color. They were not tested on um, kind of, you know, and a lot of drugs were just tested on white men mm -hmm. and they don't work for the rest of the population and you don't know until it's released in the population. So it strikes me as extremely important that you have people who aren't, um, who 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 aren't necessarily white men who are making decisions about artificial intelligence because I may I vaguely look like Felicia Rashad 30 years ago, but the camera should know better. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like, like, like and it may not, mm -hmm. which may end up in loss of life. Mm -hmm. So it's and, and I know lots of folks walk watch this after it has um after it's live so mm -hmm. hopefully we've got some young people watching it if i am the parent of a 10 year old super wonderful um black or brown kid or fabulous firecracker young lady what do i need to do and i know they have that gift but it's not necessarily being fed in school what would you tell me to do right now there are a plethora of things online that are free. Um, so, uh, what is it? Code.org is one. Raspberry Pi organization is another. Arduino is another. Um, Tinkercad 
is another one. So all of these are free online resources um, that you could go to and and your your kids could, yeah, that's code.org. And that um, that's actually really, really good for elementary age kids. So they have plugged and unplugged activities. So those activities mm -hmm. basically, like you could do it with or without a computer. Hmm, wow. Um, some books that you could read with your kids is the Ruby books, Hello Ruby books. Um, and so they have plugged and unplugged activities like where a kid makes a computer out of cardboard and stickers, you know? So it oh, at wow. least gets them to look at pieces of a computer um, without all the technical mumbo jumbo that goes along mm -hmm. with it. Yeah, that's the Hello mm -hmm. Ruby series. Um, so that's something to get them interested in this stuff early. Um, so Hello Ruby, you could do the activities online or you could do the activities without reading the books. You could get the books at Amazon. Um, but code.org is free. It, it, it's, it follows in the same vein as Hello Ruby without the, without the um, books, obviously. So code.org is free on the computer. And it's really great with those that have um, Chromebooks. So same with Tinkercad. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Tinkercad is where you could 3D model. And I wouldn't suggest using Tinkercad with kids unless they're in third or fourth grade just because of the dexterity with the computer mouse issue. Right. Um, so Tinkercad is a free online software, web-based. It's the only CAD hmm. that you don't have to download. Um, it's wow. a GUI CAD, which is graphic user interface. Um, it has what is a, a CAD, Dr. Wong? Like computer-aided design, sorry, yes. Okay, thank you. Computer-aided <laughs> design. So it's how you make 3D models. Um, ah. And you, it's a very intuitive CAD in the sense that you do drag and, drag and drop. It's a visual intuitive, so you have like, some platonic solids, the cone, cylinder, box, cube. Um, and so you drag and drop that and then you go through tutorials so you could see how you mix and mash shapes and things like that and create a whole bunch of stuff. But the neat thing about Tinkercad is they do have an Arduino plugin for your middle schoolers or advanced elementary school middle schoolers to get into coding and stuff too. So Arduino kits are normally like 50 bucks or so. And if you screw up the breadboard, you might fry some pieces and you might need to buy a new board. But Tinkercad has the circuit section on the top, on the left hand corner once you're logged in to go ahead and create some of these circuits and test these circuits out and code them yourself. And there's plenty of documentation online for this. Another resource is Instructables, um, instructables.com. And there's just some general activities. Now, that one is not necessarily curated. There, I think there's an education section, so it's safe, because otherwise there are some inappropriate things that you could learn to make. <laughs> <All right. laughs> A lot of people were like, <laughs> trying to figure out what they are. <laughs> Wait a minute. Right now, right now. They just there's Wendy out there. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Instructables. There, hmm. there are some interesting things on Instructables um, that you could make. You know, the yeah, making pasta, but then there's also making math, making engineering. Yeah. Um, some of those cool activities. You're stuck at home. You don't know what to do with your kids. Stick them on an activity that you see on here, and it goes through step by step for them to make it. Wow. We probably have time for one more question, and I want you to get in a, at least a couple of minutes here about uh, the innovation in the Hattiesburg community. That's kind of. <laughs> I love that question uh, because that's, that's my husband. I'm not going to. Oh, okay, <laughs> you're not going to answer that, right? <laughs> Talk a little bit about the economic development connections of what y'all are doing in the Hattiesburg community, a little bit of what that, what that looks like and, you know, how uh, it's coming about. Yeah, definitely. So we, we've, in, we've helped, like, there's a bath bomb person and then there's a light up street sign person. And there's a couple more that I've had to sign NDAs for, for sure. Um, and it's just to talk about how machines could help their their areas, and then we generally push them on to um, we'll push them on to uh, MPI Mississippi Polymer Institute to do like a big product, or um, we'll push them to somewhere else where they could fabricate mm -hmm. um, some of their stuff. 
So, or we'll, we'll push them on to the Trent Law Entrepreneurship Center because we're not business people. <laughs> so like if you need <laughs> help with the business right, right. or whatever, um, that's where you would head. But uh, we've become, I think, kind of that first stop of helping get things going. And then we connect you to other folks hmm. that, that can help, definitely. And there are other folks within the university or in the community itself? The university and, okay. and some within the community, too. Um, so, uh, so the accelerator is just a building, but then they rent out um, to other. So there are other biotech companies or tech companies that are renting space at the accelerator. So we've pushed some things to some polymer firms out there, too. Wow. So, yeah. And so do st and students. Just so I'm clear, students have the opportunity to get involved with some of those projects. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. And I know more of that's going on around the state than I think people understand. But but mm -hmm. from what has been told, you know, whispered in my ear, what's going on at Southern is really exciting. Ah, oh, um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I'm not just saying that because you're here. Um, <laughs> but that's what I'm hearing is that right. you know, there's some sense that it's it's really kind of leading in many ways. Um, in part because of some of the incredible people that y'all have working um, in a lot of the ways that you've been talking about. I've heard those names, those women's names that you were talking about and mm -hmm. just the work that y'all are doing there. Um, so the best way for people to, you know, we've had things up on the website, but um, is to, is what's the best way to find out more really about what's going on? Where would you point people? <laughs> That's the steam part of like being able to communicate this, right? <laughs> We're all kind of just working in our little cubicles. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, definitely you can email me, Eagle Maker Hub. Okay. We're, we're going to need to do a website overhaul, overhaul. Matt Watson, that's, you know, your job in the next week or so. <laughs> Get to After. work. After yeah. hours, right? <laughs> while he's trolling you on yeah, your I know, podcast. he's you instead of working. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he manages our Eagle Maker Hub's website, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, Accelerator is a good place. Um, if you've already have a business solution or you know where you're headed, to contact them, Monica Tysack at Mississippi Polymer Institute. And then, of course, um, Shannon Campbell and James Wilcox in business is another where another place to go. So just, I mean, we're all over the place, but if you email me, I can redirect your email too. So uh, that that is uh, until we have a centralized location, definitely um, please contact me, feel free. Well, here's what I got to say as we kind of go out of this is that uh, I'm impressed. And Kimberly's already, I know, making a date to come see you, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and I'd love I to am. come down and see what y'all are doing. I mean, it's for mm -hmm. my, you know, with my own eyes. I mean, I think it's, <laughs> it's just incredible. I mean, I, I love it. And I love hearing about it in Mississippi, you know, the things right. that you don't always break through to people that the, the innovation that is happening right here in the state, right. um, I think is really exciting. And one of the things that we're trying to do with the Mississippi Free Press, as it starts scrolling and telling me to hurry, um, is, is to tell people about these things, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and help people plug in in whatever ways that they can. So mm -hmm. we so, so appreciate you coming and being here today. I know you're really good at this. I mean, just very, <laughs> you know, wow. And, uh, and I, I just, just wonderful. Thank you so much. And, uh, and to the rest of you, uh, Kimberly and I are doing MFP Live now routinely every Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, sometimes there's a special event such as next Thursday. Uh, reporter Nick Juden and I are going to uh, host a sh the show at 4 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, and we will be interviewing Mayor Shokwe Lumumba about Jackson Water and Infrastructure. So it's a whole hour at 4 p.m. next Thursday instead of 6 p.m. We'll be letting you all know more about that and reminding you, but a whole hour to talk about water and infrastructure. So please send us your questions, show up, put them in the chat. Um, just be here for that conversation because we know that it's gonna be really great. The week after that, Dr. Karen Cox, a historian who actually 
was it Southern part of her training, but she's, she's in um, South, South North Carolina, <laughs> North Carolina now, but she just came out with the new book, uh, No Common Ground about Confederate statues. She's one of the foremost uh, authorities on Confederate statues in the, and particularly the Daughters of the Confederacy uh, in the country. And uh, she's going to be here in two weeks. So lots of great shows coming up. Meantime, I, I'll get in a lot of trouble with Kimberly if I don't say go throw some money, throw a tip in our tip jar. We're nonprofit here, nonprofit media at the at Mississippi Free Press. So please donate what you can. We love $10 every month recurring. Or as she says, no amount too small, no amount too large. So I think that's becoming one of our slogans. So meantime, thank you everybody for being here. Share the show afterward. We get really most of our viewers after the, after it's live. Uh, so please tell everybody to go watch Dr. Juan in this wonderful show today. So thank you so much for being here. And we will see all of you next Thursday at 4 p.m. And thank you, Kimberly, as always.